Commission. So I'm pleased to just quickly introduce uh, a couple of very accomplished members of our faculty who certainly do continue that tradition, and I think you will find in, in their presentation this morning work that really is driven by the, the interest in, in taking what is learned at the academy out to the people. And so uh, Dr. Hartman, Dr. Stafford, they're uh, professors, uh, co-directors of the Center of Market Diffusion of Renewable Energy and Clean Technology in the John, H John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. Uh, these two faculty colleagues are really pioneers in the use of the documentary to present research to the Academy's broader audience, whether that's citizens, policymakers, business entrepreneurs, or whatever. Their work centers on sustainable entrepreneurship and the marketing of renewable energy and clean technology. In 2006, they published an article entitled Avoiding Green Marketing Myopia, which is one of the most cited pieces in the literature on green marketing. Uh, these two faculty colleagues were also very much involved in playing a key role in launching uh, one of Utah's first commercial wind power projects. Uh, this actually involved a multiple year struggle uh, and that struggle has been chronicled in their documentary, Wind Uprising, which was premiered in April 2010. I'm told that Drs. Hartman and Stafford have an important announcement to make at the end of their presentation this morning. We'll look forward to that and join me in welcoming them here. Well, thank you so much, President Albrecht, for those kind remarks, and uh, thank you for Mark McClellan for choosing us to uh, present at the Sunrise Session. We're very pleased to be here, and I'd also like to thank a number of our colleagues who are here today, our department head, Jim Davis, um, our colleague, Deanna, our dean, uh, Dean Anderson, um, and Ken Bartkus, another colleague, and am I missing someone? Oh, I didn't see Aaron. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I knew, I, I'm sorry. I knew if I started this, I would miss somebody. So Aaron, thank you very much, and family. Uh, so we're very pleased to be here today. And we're going to present, we're going to be presenting two overarching research findings uh, from the research that we've conducted for almost 20 years. Um, Ed Stafford and I are marketing professors, uh, but as President Albrecht mentioned, for the past 10 years, uh, with research funding that we've had from the Department of Energy. We've looked at wind education outreach in Utah and studied the Spanish Fork Wind Project. And some people refer to us as the wind power professors. Um, maybe because we're windy, I don't know, but I think it's because of, of the research. Uh, but we're gonna be talking about sustainable entrepreneurship, which is the idea of creating a business uh, with a sustainability objective in mind, an entirely new business. And then we're going to be talking about how to do that successfully. From our research, uh, we see that businesses have to connect uh, their marketing strategies with government policies and with social issues and concerns. And those are our three dots, government, business, and society. We use that term because it was given to us by one of our informants. Uh, but we have a more formal title that you'll see in the research presentation uh, that's called the Tri-Sector tri -sector Leadership. And just a minute, let me turn that on. So for 20 years, almost, Ed and I have researched one central question. Um, how do we move society onto a more sustainable path? Um, and that question was relevant 20 years ago. It's still relevant today because it's a very complex, multifaceted problem, um, and the solutions are ambiguous, unclear, uh, sometimes contentious, involve trade-offs, and so it is not an easy challenge. Um, also, as you know, sustainability in general uh, means that the way that we use our resources today will not compromise how future generations are able to use, to use theirs. Uh, but even though we're trying to achieve environment, environmental and social challenges, economics are always a pressing concern. Uh, so the definition of sustainable entrepreneurship that we have derived um, is the idea that businesses uh, can protect and sustain the natural environment 
and, and provide economic and social gain for themselves and for others uh, by building new businesses. In essence, what we're saying, that you can take the entrepreneurial spirit um, and through training and education um, and sometimes just building the, the motivation that the entrepreneur already has, uh, build businesses that will provide social good as well as economic good. And we had a very interesting exchange with a newspaper reporter as we were getting ready for this talk um, who said to us, will business really do this? Uh, you know, will, will a business person create a business for social good? And we said, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we've done this right here in Utah uh, with the Spanish Fork Project. And Ed is going to be talking in detail about that. But I will just tell you this. Um, this is one of the most, maybe the most, uh, urban wind project in the country, which means uh, that the citizens of Spanish Fork and Mapleton have agreed to look at the wind turbines every day. Uh, now, they didn't accept them willingly in the beginning, and they actually came forward and appealed to the city council uh, and the mayor to put a building moratorium on the project. Uh, but what the city council and mayor did was appoint those residents uh, on a committee to work with the developer um, and come to a resolution. Now, the reason that I mention this um, is because what transpired in, I guess, sort of a more natural or, or organic way was that the entrepreneur got thrown in to working in the government sector and working with the citizens and harmonizing his development strategies with their interest. Um, and so what Ed and I have concluded is if we can look at how that happened in Spanish Fork naturally and combine it with our theories, then we can develop a roadmap or a process model for other entrepreneurs to follow and not have to go through four years of a development process and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, we also um, do our research because we hear these comments, such as business won't do that or business can't do that. Well, we think business can and business is a pivotal force. Now, when we're gonna be talking about wind energy today, um, actually Ed and I have investigated a broad uh, section or sector of industries. And we've seen how sustainability can, do, can be done in major industries and transformations that are taking place. So we've looked at hybrid electric cars. And so I'd like to point out that Utah State is also you know, working in this area with, with our wireless electric bus. Uh, we have solar energy being used in our new agricultural building. And of course, that's the beautiful Spanish Fork Wind Project there, uh, the last slide. Now, I would like to um, not give you a, a, a lesson in research by any means, uh, but I do want to make a few comments about how the research that we do may differ from some of the other research that's been presented, because we don't do our research in a laboratory. Uh, we do it in the field. So what we do is we look at a business practice as it's happening. We like to look at a contemporary ph phenomenon in a real life setting. Uh, we've looked at research on two levels. Uh, we've looked at how businesses were changing their existing practices uh, to meet sustainability issues. And I'm gonna present a couple of those studies in a minute. And then we've also looked at the idea of how to create entirely new businesses, which is more about what Ed is gonna be talking about after me. Then we take that information and we combine it with our theories. And so we look at entrepreneurship theory, uh, we look at market innovation, and we see what theory, theory says we, sh we could do, what people are actually doing, and then we try to develop uh, recommendations, lessons learned that businesses can follow. We have looked, as I've said, across a broad uh, section of industries. I'm going to talk about two today. Uh, research projects that we've done in the fast food industry, McDonald's, and research that we've done in, the, in rice farming, uh, California rice industry. 
Uh, the issues that we looked at in these two areas uh, with McDonald's, probably no surprising, it was waste management. Uh, the restaurant creates a, a lot of trash uh, that they have to deal with. And it came, it came under the criticism of an environmental group. And again, in rice farming, uh, we looked at an issue that arose because of field burning, probably something you're already also familiar with because we live in an agricultural area and you've witnessed that. Now, when we looked at these issues, uh, what struck us, what, what, which was really novel about this, is these businesses joined forces with environmental groups to figure out the solutions. And you may be thinking, will environmental groups work with businesses? And we were surprised when we saw that to begin with. Uh, but they, even though there are two different cultures, um, they know that sometimes they can figure out solutions where both sides might win, instead of one side winning and the other side losing. Um, so McDonald's worked with the Environmental Defense Fund to address their waste management issue. And the California rice farmers worked with Ducks Unlimited to solve their problems. So I want to tell you a little bit about these two partnerships before I turn the time over to Ed. Um, so in, in the case of the McDonald's EDF partnership to solve the waste management problem, what was interesting to us was the why of this partnership, why it originated, and then how the process proceeded to find the solution. And the why is why I have Ronald McDonald there looking like the Pied Piper. Uh, because what happened was uh, the head of the Environmental Defense Fund, Fred Krupp, uh, was having a Happy Meal, sharing a Happy Meal with his son in the restaurant. And he looked around and he saw all the trash you know, flowing out of the, the bins and everything and he said, you know, children are here every day celebrating all kinds of events, and McDonald's is a bad role model uh, for the environment. And instead of then mounting a campaign against the, the restaurant, he decided to approach them and offer the services of the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and you can see we have Environmental Defense Fund activists uh, working behind the McDonald's counter, you know, frying, working at the grill. That wasn't what he offered. Um, he didn't offer uh, that they would come and work in the restaurant. Uh, but what happened was um, the McDonald's said, sure, you know, I don't, I don't know if they said immediately sure like that, but anyway, uh, they engaged in a, in a discussion. Um, and so the activists first suggested the idea of using reusable dishes, you know, much like you're eating off of today. And so McDonald's then, you know, at that point said, we don't think you understand the fast food business. Um, so then they said, well, maybe we don't. Uh, so they went into the restaurant and, and worked in McDonald's to see what took place. Now, what's fascinating about this is they came up with a number of waste management practices that would reduce the amount of uh, paper and plastic waste that the restaurant was generating. Little things like using smaller napkins uh, and using ketchup uh, dispensers instead of the little packets, which they still do today, which sound like inconsequential things. But if you're selling billions of hamburgers, this is millions of dollars. Um, so McDonald's uh, had millions of dollars in savings from not using resources and then also not having to pay to deal with the trash. And so it ended up being a win-win uh, for the environment, uh, for society, because you now have a better role model for children, um, and for the company, because they were saving money. And I should also mention uh, that this was sort of a groundbreaking uh, partnership. It occurred in, in the 1990s. Uh, now, the second partnership that I'll talk to you about um, is the one between the California rice industry, uh, Ducks Unlimited, California Waterfowl Association, a number of different partners. Uh, the reason that we chose to study this uh, was because the McDonald's partnership was one that had already disbanded. They had published their report. They were no longer working together. 
And this partnership was one that we identified, uh, which was still ongoing. It was much more diverse. It was a multi-sector partnership. Uh, it was close to Utah, so we could travel there um, and actually interview our informants on site. Um, and it also had a, a problem uh, that we related to uh, with respect to agriculture. Now, historically, uh, rice farmers in the Sacramento Valley, Valley had faced the problems of water use. Um, in fact, uh, one of the informant activists uh, that we interviewed had actually publicly, so I can say his name is Mark Reisner, he had referred to rice farming in the Sacramento Valley as a monsoon crop in the desert. Um, and even though they didn't use that much water, it looks because, you know, it's a wide expanse of water, although it's not very deep. Um, so they had faced this issue of being criticized for using too much water. Their other problem was land use development. And so over time, the rice farming industry in the Sacramento Valley had taken over 90% of the natural habitat of wildlife and ducks. And so this is why they came under the scrutiny and criticism of Ducks Unlimited. But the problem that brought the partnership together, uh, as I said, was field burning. And what happened was that citizens were complaining about air quality, uh, but at the time the fields were burned, the legislature was also in session downwind from the rice fields. Um, and so they thought, they thought, yes, this is an issue. Uh, so in 1990, they enacted a graduated burning moratorium where the rice farmers would need to decrease the amount that they burned by 10% every year, and by the year 2000, not be burning at all. Um, so the rice farmers started to look at what they could do um, in order to get rid of the rice stubble, because that's what they were doing. They were dealing with the post-harvest stubble uh, that was in the fields and not burn. And what they found was there were some organic farmers who flooded their fields uh, to deal with this, uh, because there, there would be a decompos decomposition system set up. Well, as I mentioned, water use was an issue. Uh, so here is the rice industry and they're going to be going to the, the Bureau of uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and asking for more water. Um, and so they were working with Ducks Unlimited, and Ducks Unlimited was very behind this idea because flooding in the winter would mean that they would create temporary well, temporary habitat for the ducks who were migrating. And, and so they offered to help the, the rice farmers you know, implement the solution. Well, as it turned out, uh, when the rice fields were flooded, um, they actually then created what one of our informants referred to <laughs> as a bed and breakfast for ducks. Um, and this is how we gather our ideas for sustainable entrepreneurship, uh, because the rice farmer um, who told us this in our interviews, um, happened to be a very business savvy rice farmer. Um, he was the largest and the most successful rice farmer in the valley. In fact, our other informants referred to him as a rice baron. And we, you know, we didn't know what a rice baron was until we met him. Um, and so he told us, this is great. Well, can you guess why this was great? <laughs> right. Um, so, then he went on to say uh, that I now have a second harvest. Um, so that, you know, after I've, I've taken my rice and, and, you know, it's been rolled down. And, uh, and he would sell duck blinds to some really wealthy hunters from New York. That's what he told us. Uh, but what's interesting about this, he also knew that he couldn't over harvest the ducks. Because the more, I don't know if they were bad shots or what, but the more ducks he had, the more he could, you know, the more he could ask for the duck blinds. And so that's kind of like the idea of a sustainable entrepreneur. Um, you're, you're conserving your resource base so you can continue to use it. And so he was accidentally being a, a sustainable entrepreneur. Now, I just have a couple more things uh, to say. Hopefully, I've not gone over my time by too much. Uh, uh, 
because there are many, many fun things that I could tell you about this partnership. Uh, because as I mentioned, Ed and I traveled with our families uh, to the Sacramento Val Valley for a week and talked to dozens of people about the partnership. Uh, but here are some interesting ideas that feed back into our model for leadership. Uh, first of all, to do the winter flooding, uh, the farmers needed to press or, or roll the stubble into the ground uh, so it would start to decompose and they could use le less amount of water. But that was, they couldn't do that with their existing equipment uh, because it was marshy and the, the tractors would sink into the ground and everything. And so Ducks Unlimited said, we'll do the R&D um, on the rollers. And so here you have an environmental organization which is working as the business research and development. They developed the rollers and they gave them to the farmers and then some of the farmers bought them and then they started a rolling business for other farmers. Um, what also happened was the rice baron, who became convinced uh, of this practice, promoted the idea to other rice farmers. So he worked, we would say, to develop social good. And then what was probably most in interesting to us is the environmental organization Ducks Unlimited who had traditionally been protesting uh, the, the rice farming practice because of the land use primarily. After they started working with them, uh, one of our informants from Ducks Unlimited said, you know, it's really interesting because now when I go see my uh, you know, rice farming friends, they don't know if I have on a black hat or a white hat. Yeah, until we, you know, until we start our conversation. Uh, they also had, you know, rice farmers who then worked for Ducks Unlimited, and so you have all of this sort of crossover uh, leadership roles in the different areas. So my last uh, piece of information that I'll share with you, um, as President Albrecht mentioned, uh, one of our pieces has been very, very popular. I didn't talk about it today, but we could certainly talk about it if there are questions and answers, questions about it later. Uh, green marketing myopia. It has been, uh, you know, uh, it has gained exposure in a variety of different contexts um, out of academic journals uh, in the popular press um, and our documentary. Uh, because uh, the type of research that we do, case research, uh, we basically look at the history of something. And so in some respects, we work as historians. Um, so we see it very natural then um, that we disseminate our work by using documentary film. Um, and one, you, you can see that we have received several awards for this, um, and the, the one that we, that Ed and I liked the best, uh, came from the Community Wind Group. And when they recognized this, they said, um, you know what's really extraordinary about your work? is you've taken something uh, that's boring, no, they didn't say boring, uh, but, they, but they said uh, something that's ev that can happen every day uh, to wind developers and can be very challenging. You know, this process went on over four years and you've made it informative and engaging and inspiring. And probably, unfortunately, I'll have to admit, uh, one of the reasons why this might be true is because the people in our film are all of our informants. They are not me and Ed talking. Um, and we were filmed uh, as part of the, you know, the film production, uh, but our film production company, and, and we were paying them out of our grant, uh, put none of the footage of us in the film. <laughs> so. My apologies for having to talk to you about my research today. I appreciate your uh, interest and attention. And now I'll turn it over to my entertaining colleague, Ed. Thank you, Kathy. But let me just say the reason why we were cut out is we had to keep the film under 30 minutes, okay? And so we had to cut something out. Uh, for those of you who are interested now in becoming sustainable entrepreneurs, what I'd like to do now is to actually show you our framework and to give you a road map as to what does it take to initiate a sustainable business and, a, and to get a sustainable technology or clean technology into the marketplace. We have uh, found that it's a three-step process. The first step is recognizing 
an environmental problem and its solution. And I'll tell you right there, that first step is very complex and it's difficult. First of all, some environmental problems are hairy, difficult, um, complex issues that need to be addressed, and sometimes their solutions are not easily addressed. And one of the companies that we're looking at right now is Tesla, and Elon Musk, who is the CEO and one of the founders of the company, uh, his vision of Tesla is that we need to address our oil dependency, our addiction to foreign oil, and also we need to address our air quality problems. So what his vision is, is that perhaps in the next 10 years we'll be driving electric cars that are powered by the sun. I was just in Silicon Valley this past summer and actually had seen some of the solar powered charging stations that are being developed in Silicon Valley for electric vehicles. Uh, and so this here is one of the examples of the solution that Tesla is looking at to try to address our air quality and oil dependence issues. So once you've identified and found a solution, the next step now is to evaluate can you create a business out of electric cars? Uh, you know, the image of electric cars, I hate to say, is that they look like little golf carts, they're gutless, you know, uh, type uh, entities, and that creates a real challenge if you're trying to uh, develop a, a business model to try to sell something to mainstream consumers. Uh, what's interesting about Tesla is that they've decided not to make cars look like golf carts or to have putt-putt power, but literally design them to, uh, to match the performance of Porsche 911s. And so if any of you have seen Teslas, they are the fastest cars you can buy on the market. Uh, the current one that's out now, the S, the Tesla S, is about an $80,000 car. Um, and it's uh, quite remarkable because they're going after a fairly uh, wealthy target audience. And so again, as an entrepreneur, you have to decide who your key target market is, how are you going to design the product so that way it's going to appeal to those first adopters. And so in many respects, we find that Tesla is so successful now because they have figured out how to get an unusual product like an electric car into the marketplace. So you need to evaluate, can you build that business model and do you have the wherewithal to actually develop that? And last but not least is the implementation. Um, what's interesting about Tesla is that they don't have car dealers, okay? They sell the cars in shopping malls, in stores that are like Apple stores, okay? So, um, so this is very interesting. So they're totally bypassing the traditional automobile market of, uh, of dealerships and are using the shopping mall as a means of actually bringing people in, uh, playing with the product like it's an Apple gadget, and so far it's been very successful. Uh, within the next few years, they're planning to launch an SUV, and they're also planning to launch a $30,000 electric car. So it could very well be that this business model that we're seeing unfold this decade could be the way or the path to get you and me to be in electric cars, maybe by the end of the decade. Um, now, in order to go through that process, that three-step process, we have found that entrepreneurs need to engage in four different unique roles. The first role is as business entrepreneur, and this, for any of you who are entrepreneurs already know what this takes. It means uh, figuring out who your target market is, figuring out production, finding investors, um, who am I going to sell to, those types of things. The second key issue that may not be part of the traditional entrepreneurship process is the notion of policy entrepreneur. What we have found across our research, whether it's been the Rice Lens Habitat Partnership or uh, looking at natural refrigerants, which I'm not going to talk about in detail today, but other di different cases, is that we have found that government very often can be a barrier to this. And let me just give you two examples with electric cars. Uh, in the state of Texas, it is illegal to sell cars without a dealer, okay? So Tesla technically cannot sell their car in Texas because there is a law in place that says the car must sell through dealerships. And right now, Tesla has a direct to market. You can go online and buy the car direct from the company. And so Tesla's uh, founders and Tesla's uh, managers now have to figure out, because tex Texas is a big market, and they've got a lot of wind power, which we can talk about later. And so it matches the vision that Musk sees for Tesla of having cars powered by renewable energy, that Texas really is a great place to be selling your car, but they can't right now uh, because of this law. Right here in Utah, the Public Service Commission just this last month 
allowed for the development of charging stations in the state of Utah. What happened was, is that it is illegal to resell electricity in the state of Utah. And so if you, huh? Oh. That's not exactly what it was. Oh, it wasn't exact, okay. But what happened was, is that they could not develop the charging stations or facilitate. This is what I read in the Salt Lake Tribune. Oh. Okay, so what it was is if you, if you charge people to use the charging stations, yes. then you could be regulated as a public utility. Okay. Because you're I see. Okay. And what the Public Service Commission did and what the legislature is hopefully going to do is say you are not within the definition of a public utility if that is all that you are doing. I see. Okay. Well, thank you for the clarification. So but the point is, is that there was a barrier to get those charging stations into the ground here in Utah. And now that that has been cleared, as from what I under, or it is moving. It's, it's been cleared the Public Service Commission. It will hopefully be put in Utah code to kind of solidify that also during the next session. Wonderful. So what, what's nice about this is that the entrepreneurial process then requires that we need to work through the Public Service Commission and the state legislature in order to facilitate the development of these charging stations. So, uh, so again, this is what's really critical in terms of if I'm going to launch a new technology, I need to be able to be, uh, to be able to go through and work through the policy issues that are involved that may create barriers for my project. We also need to be social entrepreneurs. What we've also found is that many times there are social barriers that prevent projects and pre prevent technology from being implemented into the marketplace. And one example we'll be talking about is the Spanish Fork Wind Project when many citizens were opposed to having those wind turbines in their backyard. And so as a policy, or excuse me, as a social entrepreneur, one needs to uh, be able to develop what is the social benefit for people who will be uh, uh, engaged in this particular project or engaged in this particular technology. And last but not least, what we find is, is that we also need to be collaborative entrepreneurs because we have not found that any entrepreneur who has tried to launch a sustainable technology has been able to do it by him or herself. They've had to collaborate with other entities in order to facilitate this process. So what I'd like to do is just to go over briefly parts of the Spanish Fork Wind Project uh, to give you some insight as to what were some of the challenges that Tracy Livingston and uh, Christine Michael, his uh, um, engineering uh, partner, worked on in terms of developing this project. Now what's been very interesting for us is that we interview these people who are very interested in sustainable and, and, and social issues and it's actually quite inspiring because what Tracy told us in one of the interviews is that this time I want to make a difference in the world. He had been a serial entrepreneur who had come out of the medical uh, device field, had made millions of dollars, and he was looking for something new that he thought he could actually make a difference in Utah. And so he decided that he wanted to pursue renewable energy as, uh, as that goal. What he found was that it was much more challenging than he had ever thought he had had prior to uh, his experience as an entrepreneur. So building the first wind project in Utah first, it started out he needed to site his project. He needed to find a location where it would have good wind resources. They found Spanish Fork to be an ideal location for that. Second thing he needed to do was to procure investors, okay? The third thing he needed to do then was to how to sell the wind to the local utility monopoly. Now, here's the challenge if you want to sell electricity, that it is a regulated market, and so that there are regulations involved in terms of how much you can actually sell your product for. And so immediately, Tracy found that he had to become a policy entrepreneur. Here's what the challenge was. Uh, we have law, a federal law called PURPA, which is the Public Utility uh, Regulatory Policies Act, which says that qualifying facilities, which is, would be small wind farms that Tracy was planning to build, utilities, local utilities, must buy the electricity from those qualifying, uh, excuse me, must buy that renewable energy from those qualifying facilities uh, at what they call the avoided cost. And there are kind of two definitions of avoided cost. One is what the current cost is to produce that power by the utility or what the utility would buy off the, off the market. Okay, now what happened was is that much of Rocky Mountain Power's energy was being produced by aging coal plants 
that had been basically depreciated. And so here in Utah, we have very low electricity rates because we get our electricity from a lot of older coal-fired facilities. And so the price that Rocky Mountain Power was planning to sell the power to uh, for Tracy was not going to really even meet his break-even point. And so his purpose here, or his perception was, is that uh, after about three months of trying to negotiate, he said that, you know, this really doesn't make sense. What you're asking me to do is to sell my wind power, which is modern, clean, um, and you want me to sell it to you at your basically your old depreciated coal prices. That's almost like saying if you wanted to buy a new hybrid car, you only can buy it for the price of your, the Kelly Blue Book price of your, you know, gas guzzling jalopy. And so his perception was that this was really not an effective way of trying to sell electricity. He said that the wind power should be sold at prevailing market prices, not at the cost function of the utility. And so what he needed to do was to go to the Public Service Commission to figure out how he could come up with a more equitable price so that he could make his project work. And so he actually collaborated with Utah Clean Energy, uh, an economist from Westminster, and what they found was that Rocky Mountain Power was already buying power in Idaho, wind power, at a competitive price that was what he basically needed for his wind project, and that price had actually been procured through a competitive bidding process. So that wind in Idaho was a prevailing price that matched other types of uh, fuel that uh, Rocky Mountain Power was procuring, and so they came up with this notion of a market proxy as a means of setting the price in Utah. It took two years to develop this market proxy process, and here is an example of where Tracy had to be a policy entrepreneur, literally set policy on how he could price his wind in the state of Utah, and that helped facilitate uh, the, his, uh, his project. So again, this is an example of how an entrepreneur literally will need to work through government agencies, work through regulators, work through the legislature to identify ways to get his technology uh, working in the marketplace. So here's an example going back to our framework here. So Tracy is the business. He needed to work with the Public Service Commission and he collaborated with Utah Clean Energy and also an economist from Westminster. So here's an example of how this kind of tri-sector systems thinking is necessary in order to get a project into the ground. But Tracy had another problem. And this basically was that once he figured out that he had a decent price and that he could build his wind project, suddenly there was an uprising in the Spanish Fort community that the citizens didn't want to have it and they demanded a moratorium. Now, as Kathy had mentioned before, Tracy had already gotten approval from the Spanish Fork City Council that his project could go into the ground. And now, six months after the fact, people were saying, hey, we don't want these big giant turbines in our backyard. What's in it for Spanish Fork? Um, many of the citizens were noting that the ordinance that was governing wind power in Spanish Fork seemed to put their turbines, or seemed to put Tracy's turbines very close to homes. So they were very unhappy with how uh, the project was going to be situated in their community. Uh, and one of the dramatic parts of our film, we actually have footage from the city council meeting, and this is my favorite line in our first documentary, Wind Uprising, Tracy pleads to the city council, I'm not the evil developer here, you know? Um, and, and basically he is saying that, uh, you know, he believes that wind power needs to be developed in the state of Utah and that he sees this as gonna create social good in the community. And here's where suddenly he had to become a social entrepreneur. Uh, Tracy had talked about that jobs would be created in Spanish Fork and that it would uh, you know, be a benefit to the community. But if you think about it, if you're living in Spanish Fork and Mapleton and you already have a job, maybe job creation is not all that important to you. And so one of the things that we learned from this and that Tracy learned was that he really needed to frame those social benefits to how they would benefit those homeowners and those citizens in the community. And so one of the things that he did was he compromised. They moved the wind project away from the homes. He met with the protesters in the community and they actually worked for a couple of weeks to come out with a compromise as to where they could move the wind project. 
And more importantly, he communicated what was the social value of the wind project in the community. And what it was going to be was, is that the wind project would generate 26% of Spanish Forks property taxes. And that 26% increase in property taxes, that would pay for the entire ambulance service in the community. And more importantly, as you know, uh, property taxes in the state of Utah, the vast majority of them go to the local school district. So who the real big winners here were the Nebo School District, and it was all the children and school students in the city of Spanish Fork who would benefit from the Spanish Fork Wind Project. So by being able to connect what was the benefit of the wind farm to what the citizens were going to make, that actually built broader support for the community. What's very interesting, First Wind in Milford, that has built the large 300-megawatt uh, Milford project, they've actually developed scholarships for students at the Beaver and Milford High School uh, for them to go into engineering. And what the intent is is that those kids will come back to Beaver and to Milford and work in their communities and actually work on the wind farms out in that, in that area. So they see that part of their social good or the social benefit that they can give back to those communities is scholarships to the, the, uh, to the kids. Uh, First Win in Hawaii actually has a hatchery and wildlife uh, development where they actually are trying to uh, develop a net um, benefit of wildlife and um, wild plants on the Hawaiian Islands for their presence of actually generating wind power on Maui and Oahu. So it's interesting that these social entrepreneurship aspects are critical in order to get sustainable entrepreneur uh, ship process in the ground. So looking back at what Tracy did here, the business needed to work with the city council to make sure that he could continue his wind project and he engaged with uh, Utah Clean Energy and also the Nebo School District in order to make that uh, win. And again, he worked and collaborated with other entities in order to uh, get his project in the ground. This is a picture of me with the Utah Wind Working Group. Kathy and I uh, actually were involved. We were founding members of the Utah Wind Working Group uh, to uh, basically learn from the ground up of how wind power would develop in the state. When we interviewed the mayor, one of the things that he noted here was that this was a win-win-win for the city. His quote was, you know, everyone won in this deal. The city wins, we get a lease and property tax payments, which will be millions of dollars. Uh, the school district will be the big winners, and we actually have this quote in our film where he talks about how, you know, once the Spanish Fork Wind Project was in the ground, uh, it has been a net benefit for the community. So where do we go from here? Well, if you want to do sustainable entrepreneurship, you need to think about all three sectors simultaneously. And what we need is, as a business, we need to have viable business models figuring out who our target market is, how do we set up our profitability, do we go after those wealthy men who want fast cars to sell our electric vehicles that Tesla is doing. Um, we need to have smart policies in place that are not going to inhibit the development of uh, different types of technology that we're trying to uh, implement. And last but not least, we need to have social acceptance of our, uh, of our technology. Uh, and how we do this is by these four different entrepreneurial roles that we've seen. Um, one of the cases I didn't cover here uh, actually involved Greenpeace, and we've actually interviewed activists at Greenpeace that worked on natural refrigerants. And this quote is kind of the uh, inspiration for our title. Uh, this particular activist was telling us that, you know, no one is connecting the dots in government and business. The EPA's concern is the Clean Air Act. Manufacturers, sustainability is not in their uh, purview. Nobody else is connecting the dots. Uh, we have to be the self-interest on behalf of the better solution. And so what she's basically saying here is, is that you know, environmental activists, while some of you might think that they're you know, wild and we want to stay away from them, very often they understand environmental issues extremely well. And when businesses partner with them, they can actually develop those long-term solutions uh, that can actually help facilitate uh, those, uh, those businesses. So some of the lessons learned here is that business skills are critical in order for a, a society to move on to a more sustainable path. 
Uh, one of our activist colleagues or activist informants told us that she said that businesses are demons of innovation. And so, uh, and she was kind of saying it in a, in a double sort of way because she said sometimes your business can be a demon, but they said they're demons of innovation. And once you've got them on board, it's amazing what businesses can do to actually facilitate sustainability. Uh, government policies may be barriers. So if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you need to study and understand what are those potential barriers, whether it's challenges for developing uh, charging stations or there are dealer laws that you can't sell in certain states because of, of dealership laws. Um, environmental NGOs may be the most critical sources of key information of long-term sustainable solutions. And what we have found is that very often environmental NGOs, they commonly navigate both the social and government sectors. And so if you partner with environmental groups, they can help the business get through those uh, government circles and get through those social uh, areas in order to build support for your project. And lastly, kind of seek the win-win-win uh, of, um, of all three sectors. Okay, so this is the big announcement that we're very excited about. One of the last uh, projects that we had for this grant that we had from the Department of Energy was to produce a second documentary. Uh, we'll be premiering tomorrow at the uh, Inner Mountain Bioneers. We're very excited about it. Uh, it talks about how America can procure 20% of its electricity from wind. And you may be surprised, but the idea came from George W. Bush in 2006 after he talked about America's addiction to oil in his State of the Union address. We start with George Bush, have actually some exclusive footage of uh, President Bush talking about this vision. The Department of Energy did an extensive study in 2008 to show that it is possible. And what Kathy and I have done for the last few years is actually gone out to find out how states are attempting to implement this 20% vision. Three states now are already procuring over 20% of their electricity from wind. Iowa, uh, South Dakota, and Kansas. We have exclusive interviews with John Huntsman. We have exclusive interviews with Terry Branstead of Iowa. And we have exclusive interviews with Brian Schweitzer of Montana where what those governors have done in their states to help bring about uh, renewable energy development. Uh, and so we will be talking about that in terms of policy and transmission development, and we present a roadmap in that film as to how America can achieve that. Those are all the comments I have, and be happy to take any questions or comments that you have. Yes. You know, that's, we have not worked with Libby Foods, and that might be a wonderful next uh, case for us to examine. Thank you, Libby. Question? Oh, yes, sir. One of the trends over the past couple of decades, and it's driven by certain facets in the commercial and social media, is that everything is adversarial. There are not just good guys and bad guys, but wonderful guys and evil guys. Collaboration, cooperation is tantamount to treason. And, you know, if you get into any collaborative effort, uh, you're going to have people out there just beating the drums about all these terrible people. They've given in to the other side. What is this trend doing to what you're looking for? Uh, well, one of the things that, that we have found, and I didn't mention it in the uh, McDonald's EDF alliance uh, that came about, was that the, the environmental group and the business, as they were working through potential solutions, found out they didn't agree on everything. And so they just kind of stepped back and said, let's you know, do what we can do, uh, but we can also agree to disagree. Um, and Greenpeace is also interesting in this, in this regard because they have partnered with business. Uh, well, they will still protest, sometimes the same business. Um, and so recently uh, there was a situation where uh, our informant was going to be on a panel with somebody from Unilever uh, accepting an award and another 
arm of Greenpeace was protesting Unilever on that same day because I can't I think remember. It was fishing or something. Fishing or, yeah. somewhere. So, so, uh, they, so were, they were protesting yeah. the company. And so she went to the Unilever executive and she said, will you be comfortable you know, with me um, on the podium today accepting the award when you know that my colleagues are protesting your company? And he said, well, you know, Everything's not perfect, and so there are issues, and you know we're working together on this, and, and we agree, and so we can do this. What we what we say, you know, our win-win-win idea. If people persist in the adversarial approach, um, if one side loses, you know, based on our model, because we're all connected, we all lose. So it's not really win-lose; it's lose-lose-lose. And I'm not. A political person. I don't want to get into politics, but uh, you know, with the government shutdown, you know, I don't know, millions, billions of dollars that cost the economy. And so, if one side won or not, we don't need to get into that. But everybody lost, and so we see that. Yes. What other barriers have you identified at at least the state government level in Utah that we might want to address? Okay, well, <laughs> all right. Well, let, let me tell you now, this may be uh, a little controversial because here in Utah, we don't like the idea of top down government. But what has brought Iowa uh, to now procure almost 25% of its electricity from wind was uh, Terry Branston back in 1983 signed a what they call a renewable energy standard, which basically said that by a certain year, they wanted so much energy in Iowa to come from clean energy sources. And the, the, what he says in this, and he's a Republican, and what he says in this is that both Democrats and Republicans have worked in Iowa to bring this together, is that once you have that policy in place, it actually attracts the developers and entrepreneurs to your state because they know they'll be able to sell the power. And one of the challenges that Tracy had was that he wasn't sure he was going to be able to sell his power because right when he found that his price was going to be significantly less than what he could even break even on his project. So um, I, I guess the, the, the main thing that we see is that if there could be a stronger energy standard, a kind of commitment to move in this direction, that may be a way to help facilitate some of the clean technology development uh, in the state. I don't know, Kathy, did you have any other? No, I just stepped back and you know, we get a controversial question. Oh, okay, question. so no. I'll, do, no. I'll do the controversial <laughs> questions then, okay. Um, no, what, what I was also going to say, what was also interesting um, in, in the Spanish Fork development um, was there, you know, schools aren't really government, uh, but the, the schools weren't really involved in the discussion when they were really going to be big benefiters in, in the process. And so when the citizens pushed back, um, and Tracy had to start working with them and explaining this connection. Then the school system actually um, got into the discussion and found out that the property tax revenues that they were going to get from the development of that, that piece of land was like a 16 thousand or I don't know it was a huge increase in what they were already getting and and so they and then when Tracy ran into problems and had to spend a lot of more money on on proving the second site um, the the city gave him a tax break uh, for the first 10 years of the project and that came from the school the school district said we're going to get you know, so much more money over the 20 year period that for 10 years, uh, they gave him a 70% reduction um, in the amount of taxes that they paid. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of these ideas to see how maybe nobody is going to get everything that they want, uh, but through compromise and, and working together, it oftentimes ends up being better for everyone. We're the peacemakers of the world business. No. Yes. So where can we see your new documentary? Well, uh, we're premiering it uh, tomorrow at Intermountain Bioneers. We are now working on finding a venue here in Salt Lake, so uh, we're hoping in the next couple of months to be down here to be screening it. So um, keep, keep an eye out for it. Yeah, it's called Scaling. Yeah, Intermountain Bioneers, it's going to be in Logan tomorrow. Um, and we 
felt a duty to premiere it locally for us in Logan. But uh, we, we have screened uh, Wind Uprising several times here in Salt Lake uh, at the University of Utah, at the Leonardo Museum, um, various churches. Uh, you know, a lot of these documentaries, how they are screened is kind of through a grassroots movement. So usually at universities, they screen these. And uh, that's where most academic uh, documentaries are screened. So B yeah, BYU, et cetera. Yes. You know, uh, Utah Clean Energy is actually working on that now. Um, we, we have a voluntary one. We, we have a voluntary one, so let me just clarify that it is a voluntary. Um, we, we've got some serious challenges facing the state of Utah. The state of California has a 33% renewable energy standard where they want to have 33% renewables by 2020, and so they're cutting off their coal contracts here in the state of Utah. And so we are already seeing how that potentially could impact the state's economy. I'm not saying renewable energy is going to be the only um, economic development opportunities, but I think it's one of them that could help the state move forward given our uh, solar resources. We have excellent solar. We also have good geothermal resources. So. And, and our colleagues at the uh, American Wind Energy Association, which is the International Organization um, Industry Association for Wind, uh, is working constantly to get a national renewable energy standard. Uh, because what they believe is if individual states put in their standards, then there are differences. Um, and many utilities uh, you know, operate in several states, so then it becomes, it becomes difficult. So they would prefer to have a national renewable energy standard that would be sort of standardized. And they work on that day and night. Oh, oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to clarify. Um, while we are uh, consistently uh, working on uh, measures to open the market for renewables in Utah, um, an RPS has been some, something of a political non starter for several years. Um, but uh, if there's anyone in the room that's really ready to, to go for that, let me know. But uh, that's not. Thank you very much for thank your you very much. Okay. information. Okay. Ed, Kathy, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and Dean Anderson, uh, Huntsman School of Business, congratulations on programs like this that make a difference here in the state of Utah. We hope you're going to be able to join us once again when we reconvene in February. We'll be looking at society and culture and looking at how the role of a playwright in, and designer can make a difference in theater arts, bring culture to, to us here. So thank you again. And, and Miguel, again, thank you as always for Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield, who are our sponsor. Thank you.